Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series brought to you by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education and us at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I am your host every Wednesday at noon for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. My name is Chris and I work at the museum. We've got a great show for you this afternoon. Uh, in fact, we have a great month's worth of shows set up, great lectures every Wednesday at noon right here at the museum's YouTube channel because as I'm sure all of our faithful viewers know, April 22nd is Earth Day and that makes April Earth Month. So we're just gonna celebrate all month long with stories and experiences of restoration and resiliency in North Carolina. To get us started today, I want to introduce uh, actually three special guests. We've got a panel today on the topic of sustainable seafood in North Carolina. The first person that you'll meet today is Jane Harrison. Jane is the Coastal Economic Specialist for the North Carolina Sea Grant. Jane, welcome to the show. Hi, everybody. The second presentation today will be from Leslie Vegas, and Leslie is the Coastal Restoration Specialist with North Carolina Coastal Federation. Hi, Leslie. Hi. And then bringing a little bit of flavor to the presentation today will be James Hargrove. He runs and operates Middle Sound Mariculture. He's an oyster grower. James, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Glad you all could be here today. I'm excited to learn about sustainable seafood in North Carolina. So Jane, if you want, I will turn the show over to you and we'll get started. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm just gonna turn on my presentation here. Oh, while you do that, I'll remind everybody that you can participate in today's program in the chat on YouTube or in the comments on Facebook. So as we're going through, if you have questions, thoughts, experiences, drop those into the chat and into the comments. After the presentations, I'll be moderating those back to our guest speakers and we can have a conversation around today's topics. Thanks, Jane, sorry, go ahead. Hey, no problem, thanks, Chris. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jane Harrison and I work for North Carolina Sea Grant, a NOAA program based at NC State that conducts research, outreach, and education on our coast and marine environment. I'm joined today by Leslie Vegas of the North Carolina Coastal Federation and oyster grower James Hargrove of Middle Sound Mariculture. And we are here with you today to talk about sustainable seafood, specifically the economic and environmental benefits of the North Carolina Oyster Trail. So just what is the North Carolina Oyster Trail? This is a grassroots effort by people who love North Carolina oysters and our mission of the trail is to provide oyster tourism experiences that help sustain and grow North Carolina oyster supply and demand, resulting in economic, environmental, and social benefits to the state's seafood industry and coastal communities. We have 50 plus members of the trail, 50 plus sites that you can visit. These include shellfish farm tours, seafood restaurants and retailers, and educational spots for you to visit on the trail. Be sure to check out ncoystertrail.org to plan out your own oyster adventure. Our website has an interactive map so that you can locate oyster experiences wherever you are on the coast, even inland North Carolina. Now I'm going to introduce you to some of the oyster trail destinations shortly, but first some background just on how oysters are grown in our state. So you may not realize this, but almost 50% of oysters in North Carolina are farmed. So we have 381 shellfish leases. So these are the farms that you might see out in our open waters. And this is what they look like. Basically oysters are grown in these bags or cages. They may be suspended in the water or below the water surface. We have up to 2,073 acres in production at any one time. And this type of farming is called oyster mariculture or marine aquaculture. So this is, you know, also thought of as growing shellfish and it's becoming more popular than ever in North Carolina. And just so you know, we grow the native Eastern oyster that is Crassostria virginica. 
So these are just some of the folks that are bringing oysters to your table. Generally, they are small scale family businesses. So they've got their kids helping out. Um, sometimes their dogs are on the boat and even the babies help sell the products. So it's really um, kind of an exciting group to get to know because not only do they have their own personalities, all of these different growers, um, all of their oysters have different flavor profiles that you wanna get to know across our coast. So what's been going on with our farmed oyster production? I wanna show you that we have seen tremendous growth over the last decade. So really kind of an exponential increase in the amount of oysters that are produced through farming in our state. Here you can see in 2010, you know, we had direct sales of farmed oysters that were worth about $250,000. As of 2020, we have direct sales of over $3 million. And I will say these numbers are definitely uh, conservative. So, you know, a lot of times our farmed oysters actually command a much higher price in the market than a commodity price, which these figures are based upon. So if you are out there at a nice seafood restaurant and you're eating oysters on the half shell or raw oysters, you're generally going to be eating a farmed oyster. So farmed oysters, they tend to be a little more consistent in terms of the way the shell looks um, and then the, you know, the texture of the meat and just the different kinds of flavors that you can get. Um, we find that farmed oysters are really kind of that higher value interest for the seafood consumer. Now, let's also talk a little bit about wild oysters. So what's been going on there? In the dark blue, you'll see that we've actually had a decrease in the amount of production of wild harvest oysters in North Carolina. So in 2010, um, there was about 180,000 bushels that were harvested of wild oysters. Whereas we get back, you know, all the way down to 2020 over a 10 year period and we're down to 40,000 bushels of wild oysters. And on the, you know, kind of the opposite trend line are our farmed oysters. So at this point, farmed oysters are really poised to actually take over that wild harvest uh, number. And what I wanna say here is that, you know, oyster farming can actually help to reduce harvest pressure on wild oyster populations. We are also doing some work at North Carolina Sea Grant to try to restore these wild oysters. Um, and you'll hear more about that as well from Leslie and the North Carolina Coastal Federation. But this is just one project that Sea Grant is involved in. So we're doing oyster restoration via spat on shell. And so the idea is that we have these juvenile oysters that are known as spat. And in order to grow up and become adults, they actually need to attach to a hard surface. So ideally oyster shells. And so that's what we call spat on shell. And we've been doing these pilot projects to, to restore wild oyster populations for future harvest. We've done some plantings in Carteret County this past year. And then we have more planned for Carteret, Pamlico and Onslow County. And so if you look at the picture of this oyster shell here, you can see these little brown kind of spots. And so that's actually the spat that have attached. And then you can see the man here in the picture, he's actually throwing them out in the water so that they can uh, hang out and grow up and then potentially be harvested for your dinner plate uh, down the road. So let's get back to some of these unique offerings on the oyster trail. And one of those is our shellfish farm tours. Now pictured here is Sea Vision Charters. They're based in Beaufort and they offer private boat tours to Shackleford Banks, Cape Lookout and the Rachel Carson Reserve. You can search for wild horses, dolphins, seashells and of course oysters. Captain Monty pictured here will take you to the only North Carolina oyster farm on a sandbar. That's the Sandbar Oyster Company. And you can actually purchase oysters to sample on site, and then you can also take them home with you. You may see the native oyster farmer, David Clammerhead Cessna in his natural habitat, tending to these oyster reefs. Uh, the Sandbar Oyster Company, they actually started as a collaboration between a marine scientist and a commercial fisherman. They have developed a revolutionary approach to growing oysters, building oyster reefs, and protecting shorelines. You don't want to miss this. So if you're wondering, you know, how much fun could a shellfish farm tour really be, uh, just take a look at these happy customers on the left here. 
The trail is allowing oyster growers to create a new revenue stream with tourism and to further educate the, uh, our uh, local people and the public about the environmental benefits of these mollusks. As another example of a site you can visit on the trail, don't miss Bald Head Island Conservancy. They are a nonprofit organization devoted to barrier island conservation, education, and preservation. Just off the coast from Southport, you can take the ferry to Bald Head Island, schedule a kayak trip through the oyster beds of Bald Head Creek, and then check out their retail shop for oyster related merchandise, sign up for volunteer opportunities like oyster reef restoration. Another great stop on the trail is the Blue Water Grill in Raw Bar on Roanoke Island. This is the perfect spot for a meal on your way to the Outer Banks. They serve several varieties of fresh local oysters daily. Their oyster shooters are always a hit. They host special dinners for oyster lovers and recycle oyster shells in partnership with the Coastal Federation. Now, lest you think oysters are just always on the menu, Please do not forget about their bivalve cousin, the clam. Cooper Family Seafood in Down East Carteret County grows hard and sunray vetus clams on their farm overlooking Cape Lookout National Seashore and Core Sound. Just as some folks enjoy white and red wine, there are those who love clams just as much as oysters. The Hoopers will show you how to harvest and grade these shellfish. You can even try your luck with the bull rake. They have a wonderful spot on the water and can steam up clams to taste. Now I have a question for all of you out there in the audience. I'm interested to know what causes differences in how oysters taste. A, whether it is male or female, B, characteristics of the water body that it lives in, or C, whether or not it has a pearl in it. So please note in the YouTube chat whether you think the answer is A, B, or C. So Jane, can I throw my guess into the, into the yeah, ring on this one? Yeah, Chris, what are you thinking? Uh, I think an oyster with a pearl in it probably tastes richer. Mm, well, you know, that sounds reasonable. I will say if I had an oyster with a little crab in it, I think that would be extra rich and give me some luck as well. Um, <laughs> but no, no, the actual answer here is B, characteristics of the water body that the oyster lives in. So how an oyster tastes is influenced by the body of water it comes from, the algae it feeds on, the strength of currents and tides, the mineral content of the seafloor, rainfall, temperature, seasons, and more. The Eastern oyster can take on a wide variety of flavors. And the way we often talk about this kind of idea is with the term miroir. So miroir refers to how local environmental conditions influence the oyster's flavor profile. Now, if any of you out there are wine aficionados, I'm sure you are familiar with terroir. So that's the combination of soil, climate, and other environmental factors that give wine grapes their distinctive character. And similarly, oysters have miroir representative of the waters that they grow in. So they have these really unique regional flavors that stem from subtle differences in local conditions. So you're gonna find oysters that are grown near inlets and open ocean waters. They, you know, they're gonna taste saltier than an oyster grown closer to fresh water. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie um, and stop my share here. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, let me pull up my screen. And we'll learn a little bit about how the Federation is involved um, with the trail and other oyster work. Um, so as Jane said, um, my name is Leslie Vegas and I thank you all so much for having me today. Um, I'm excited to be able to speak with you um, about our all of our oyster work that we do. Um, I work with Jane, our regional supervisor and coastal scientist, Erin Fleckenstein, our awesome volunteers and others on the oyster trail. I'm the coastal specialist in the Federation's Outer Banks office. So as an organization, we aim to protect and preserve water quality by serving all of North Carolina's coastal counties. So we have two additional offices in the central and southeast regions of the coast. 
We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we're lucky to work with many partners on a variety of goals that include water quality, advocacy, living shorelines, marine debris, and of course, oysters. It's a little bit of an overview of what I'll be speaking to you about today. Um, we'll touch on oyster biology to understand the importance of oyster restoration work, human impacts to oysters, both positive and negative, the types of oyster restoration programs that we work on, shell recycling, and what we can offer as an oyster trail member. So in order to understand the importance of oysters in our coastal ecosystems, a basic overview of their life cycle and how they feed is really key. So to start, I'll give a brief overview of the most important pieces of their reproductive process. If we start in the bottom left corner, you can see that adult oysters release their eggs and sperm and fertilization occurs in the water column when waters reach about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So around the end of spring or beginning of summertime. In a matter of just two weeks, the larvae develops a foot-like structure, which you can see in the top right corner that it uses to swim, seeking out a hard substrate, preferably oyster shells to land on. And this is an important part of the rest of the presentation. Once it finds that hard substrate, it attaches itself via a chemical process. At this point, it's referred to as spat, like Jane said, and in one to three years time, it will grow to become an adult oyster and the process can start all over again. Now we'll look at how oysters feed. So while this isn't an image of an oyster, it's a similar organism that feeds in the same way by filter feeding. So oysters use cilia or tiny hair-like structures to draw surrounding water over their gills. Suspended plankton and other small particles that can be found in the water column are transported to the mouth via mucus. Once these small particles are eaten and digested, they're expelled as feces or pseudofeces. This waste product is really dense, so it sinks to the water floor, not back up into the water column, which is an important part of why we care so much about oysters. One oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day or a whole bathtub full of water per day. So now we know a little bit more about how oysters live and function. Um, we can discuss how humans interact with them, both positively and negatively, and how the Federation works to restore oyster populations. So oysters provide a lot for people. Um, we like to refer to the three Fs, food, filter, fish, when we give presentations. But recently, we've also added a fourth F, which is finance. finance. Um, oysters provide a food source for people that includes a lot of cultural value as they're a large part of the state's history. They filter our waters, as we discussed, and oyster reefs provide habitat with their nooks and crannies for a variety of commercially relevant fin fish species and crustaceans, especially when those fish and other organisms are really small in their juvenile stage of life. Additionally, oyster restoration work and oyster farming provides many job opportunities at a variety of levels for North Carolina citizens. So while oysters provide so much for North Carolina, we do have to consider the history of why those oyster populations have shrunk so much. At this point, current harvest data shows that oyster populations in the state are only 15 to 20% of what they were at their peak in the late 1800s, as Jane was talking about. When planning for restoration, we ought to consider the harmful activity that's occurred both currently and in the past. So some of that damage was due to neglect, but some was just due to lack of knowledge. Overharvesting occurred and shells were not returned to the water. So that means that the oysters physically weren't there to reproduce and repopulate, but also that hard substrate that they look for to attach was also missing. Oysters have also, also struggled through periods of disease. They're facing increasing water temperatures and poor water quality. With stormwater runoff that comes from, not only from the coastal areas, but from central regions as well, and additional pollutants, oysters aren't able to filter out the food that they need. What are we doing to help them, which is the most important and fun part? Um, the Federation has partnered with a wide variety of stakeholders, including Sea Grant, other state agencies, federal agencies, other nonprofits, academic institutions, and more to develop a statewide plan, the Oyster Blueprint. Through this plan, restoration activities are identified for each partner to contribute to, leading to a success of an overall oyster restoration strategy for the whole state. The fourth edition of the Blueprint is set to be released at the end of April, so we are very excited to be counting down for that. 
And so what strategies are we using? We'll start with sanctuaries. Sanctuaries are large scale reefs that are constructed throughout North Carolina's sounds. They serve as marine protected areas that are typically closed to oyster harvest, but open to hook and line fishing. They're strategically located and designed to improve the wild stock of oysters by cre creating brood stock sanctuaries that can connect larvae throughout the sound. So there are currently 14 um, oyster sanctuaries in the state, and they are about 40 to 50 acres in size typically. The Federation most recently partnered to create the Swan Island Oyster Sanctuary that was completed last year in Pamlico Sound. And if possible, I'd like to share a quick video um, where you can really feel like you're there on the, on the sanctuary itself and see how it's constructed. Stevens Towing is partnering with North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries and the North Carolina Coastal Federation on this reef project. This 15 acres is part of a 50 acre larger project which should be completed by 2020. What we bring to the table is large scale equipment and industrial scale and size equipment that can build these reefs at a pace that would otherwise be unachievable. It helps marine fisheries achieve their target goals of building acres in the sound and it helps the Coastal Federation's mission of clean water in our state. So these reefs are built out of limestone marl. It's mined locally in North Carolina, not far from Newburn. It's trucked to a stockpile site where it's loaded onto barge. We transport the limestone to the reef site on this large barge and unload it with loaders and excavators. Limestone is a great substrate because it closely resembles an oyster shell in its makeup. What we're building today is a no harvest sanctuary. The intended design is to provide the seed source for countless acres on the shoreline. It also acts as a giant filter. There's approximately one million oysters per acre, so that's 15 million oysters on this reef. It's a tremendous amount of clean water back into the Pamlico Sound. The habitat this reef provides and the clean water ultimately increase the populations of fin fish and crustaceans in the sound, which is great for everybody on the coast and in the state. In building this reef, we at Stevens Towing are trying to do our part to help commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, and the coastal economy of North Carolina.
Um, so hopefully you all felt like you were really there out on the sanctuary um, and you could see all the different animals that reef support and the amount of work that really goes into constructing something like that. Um, so to create harvestable reefs, the Division of Marine Fisheries annually deposits tens of thousands of bushels of oyster shell, limestone or clam shell, which is collectively called culch in shellfish waters um, from the Shallot River to the Pamlico Sound. These culch planting sites are open to public harvest, which is really a big distinction between um, them and the sanctuary reefs. And once that happens once oysters reach the legal harvest size of three inches. Both sanctuary reefs and culch reef maps are available on the Division of Marine Fisheries websites if you're interested in learning where they are. So most importantly, do these reefs work? Um, economic impact studies show that for every $1 invested in oyster restoration, $4.05 is returned to the state. Additionally, if you look at this graph here on the right side, you can see how the different types of reefs contribute to overall oyster populations. So the blue circles indicate the size of the reef in terms of their acre, acre footprint. And the green circles indicate the density of oysters on each of these different types of reefs. So you can see that while sanctuaries are the smallest reefs overall, they host the densest population of oysters. So we would like to say that they're working. And last but not least, we have mariculture as one of our um, oyster restoration practices. So oyster farming or, or mariculture is not always seen as a method of restoration because the oysters will eventually be harvested. However, oyster leases provide numerous ecological benefits, including increased water filtration, additional habitat for those fish and other ecosystem services such as nitrogen sequestration. More oysters in the water ultimately equates to cleaner waters, no matter how and what form that they're there. Additionally, oyster growers contribute to the wild stock when the matured oysters release their free floating larvae into surrounding waters. So this produces a more robust oyster population, which is what we want. Currently, the oyster mariculture industry contributes $5 million to the state and the interest in farming has increased tenfold in the last five years. As far as we're involved, the Federation hosts a demonstration lease at our Outer Banks office where I work. This lease is a demonstration lease, which means that you can come see the different types of gear that are used to grow oysters. So Ray has a variety of gear that are out there on this one lease. Um, it hosts about 9,000 oysters or 90 bushels. And once COVID restrictions are lifted, we're excited to offer visits to the lease along with volunteer experiences with our lease manager, Ray Delvillar, who's pictured there in the bottom circle. Um, in these experiences, we're hoping that you'll be able to help clean, count, measure, and learn all about the work that he does. We also host a shell recycling program. So to get the material that is needed for these restoration projects, shells are often bought from shucking houses and delivered to project sites for two to $3 a bushel. A recycling program provides an alternative way to collect the shells that may be otherwise improperly disposed of. This type of program gives both restaurants and private consumers a chance to return the shells to the water, which is where we really think they belong. Also, it's actually illegal to drop shells in a landfill due to how expensive they are as a resource. The state did run an oyster shell recycling program for about five years, but it unfortunately lost funding in 2018. So the Federation is aiming to create a new program where we'll work with restaurants, municipalities, volunteers, and private citizens. Um, you yourself can participate in shell recycling by dropping your shells off at our um, shell recycling drop-off locations on the coast. And a list of these locations can be found on our website. And at last but not least, and most importantly, the trail. So while we help with the development of the trail, we're also really excited to serve as stops on the trail. All of our offices are stops and you can learn about more detail about our oyster programs that I've highlighted. You can stop to recycle your shells or volunteer. You can also participate in our Adopt an Oyster program where you would have the opportunity to name an oyster of your own and receive updates about the status of your oyster. If you visit the lease, you might even be able to visit your newly adopted friend. So thanks so much for tuning in and please follow along with our work on our Federation website and social media. And we also have oyster focused um, social media and a website where we're currently posting a countdown to the release of the new blueprints with lots of oyster facts and pictures. We would love to have you tag us in your pictures um, using the hashtag NC Oysters or our handle. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it over to James. Hello. 
hope everybody's doing okay. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, my name is James Hargrove. I am the owner and operator of Middle Sound Mariculture. It's a oyster mariculture company located in southeastern North Carolina. Um, we currently have multiple farm locations where we grow shellfish, clams, and a couple different types of um, Sunray Venus clam and scallops. Um, in this figure right here, these are the three locations that we currently have leased water. Um, the state allows individuals to get uh, leased water through their shellfish leasing and franchising program. And if you look at this photo, um, you, know, you might think that this would be logistically challenging to run an operation where we're producing oysters and other shellfish off of multiple leases. And you'd be correct, it is very challenging. Um, but the great thing about having multiple locations is you tap into what Jane was talking about with the marijuana of different local water bodies. Um, essentially, each one of these locations has different environmental parameters that may modify um, the flavor profile of those oysters, whether that's proximity to an inlet, which Jane mentioned will increase the salinity of that oyster or whether it's in a location like Stump Sound where we produce our Tar Heel Tide Runner, which has a very earthy, um, essentially, Rowan Jacobson coined it best, I think, in his book, The Essential Oyster, where he says that North Carolina is the Napa Valley of oysters. And essentially what he's talking about is those different flavor profiles that North Carolina has due to our uh, topography and uh, geography with all of our inlets, our creeks, our bays, our sounds, our waterways. Each one of these waterways has slightly different environmental parameters that can uh, change the flavor of the oyster. And essentially, an oyster is so variable in, in flavor, it can change based off of the tide. So you could have an oyster at low tide um, and an oyster at high tide, and those oysters may taste uh, significantly different based off of the weather parameters or other conditions. Um, Jane, go ahead and hit next slide. So uh, like Jane also mentioned, uh, most oyster aquaculture operations in the state are family owned and operated. Uh, right now we have two babies under two years old. That's Pearl in my arms and our new boy Hunter. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this slide right here, this is one of the pieces of equipment that we use out on the farm. Uh, this is a Hooper's Island oyster tumbler. Essentially, this would be the Cadillac of oyster tumblers. And this product, it allows us to do multiple things. One is if you look at the, the tube that's um, right behind me, there are multiple hole sizes. So when the oysters run through this machine, it grades them based off of their size. And um, it also, while tumbling, chips the oyster, which is if you've eaten oysters at a raw bar um, and they, they're cultured oysters, most of these oysters have a very uniform shape. And by tumbling these oysters, uh, that helps to keep that shape more uniform and also helps to grow a deeper, uh, more shapely oyster. Next slide, please. I think that's it here. Okay. Well, Jane, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, go ahead and cue up that video, please. All right. So uh, with with our operation, um, it's, it's very challenging to have multiple farms uh, in multiple locations, but another benefit that we get is we're able to um, harvest typically any time during the year. Um, and what I mean by that is there are closure events that occur naturally uh, due to rainfall events and the concern that people are eating oysters raw, that there could be runoff or bacteria because oysters are a filter feeder that uh, may cause harm to human health. And so by having these leases spread out, not only do I get the benefit of having multiple flavor profiles to be able to sell, I can also fall back on Normally, one of these farms will be open, so I'll have somewhere to go harvest oysters so we don't have a supply and demand problem. Now, 
that that isn't always true. No, uh, oyster farming is extremely difficult and we are slave to stochastic events such as hurricanes or just large rainfall events where, you know, if we get three or four inches across the state, we essentially will have all of the, the state shut down. Um, but it's relatively rare that everywhere is shut down. Um, so this video was put together by Local Seafood, who is one of our uh, main distributors. And this was set up as a virtual oyster tour event, essentially, um, where you can kind of meet the farmer. Um, a little background information on me. I studied at the UNCW's Benthic Ecology Lab before I got started in oyster mariculture. And essentially, that is what fueled my love for uh, the estuarine environment and farming oysters uh, and everything oyster related down to little crabs and worms associated with their reefs. Um, and so this video is gonna kind of walk through where some of our locations are, what the farm looks like, um, and you'll see the sorter machine um, going uh, kind of full pace there. Those are two of our contractor employees. Uh, essentially, Every day that we're out on the farm, we are pulling bags from some of our cages, uh, sorting, grading, and either harvesting or redeploying those oysters so that uh, they can be harvested in the future. Um, normally, what we do is we buy oysters and plant them on a rotational schedule. Essentially, every two months to three months, we will plant another batch of around 100,000 oysters. Um, when, when we buy them, we buy them at four millimeters in size. And essentially that would be about the size of a five pound bag of uh, potatoes. Um, so they, it can be uh, very small. Um, and essentially you can buy them at whatever size you would like, but the four millimeter size seems to be the easiest for us to be able to maintain uh, it, they are a lot of work at that smaller size because they grow so fast. When, what we're trying to do is keep those oysters as single oysters for the half shell. That's our target market. Um, but if you don't handle the oysters frequently, you can end up with clustering or biofouling that ends up degrading the product slightly, which you can decrease your product or just have an inferior product out on the market, which we try very hard to keep um, those, those oysters very consistent and, um, free of any fouling. So that way the end consumer has a nice, clean, consistent product that's easily shuckable. They know what they're going to get when they order from me again. And, um, the flavor profile is something that we can't control. However, um, that diversity is something that we relish. Great. Thanks, James. Um, I'm just going to share my screen one more time to show a couple more uh, items here uh, just for the audience's participation. I'm interested to know because this is often something I hear. Um, just what do you all think about this? So when can you eat oysters? Is it A, days with a Y, that's any day, any month, or B, months with an R, so September through April. So I'll give you a moment to think through that. I, I am interested to know what you're thinking, Chris, here. Um, I don't know if you've heard one of these old adages or not about when you can eat oysters. I, I've got to say that my experience with oysters is pretty limited. Uh, it extends to one opportunity where I ate oysters and two or three opportunities where I have hosted presentations with people who know a whole lot about oysters. So I feel like I really should know this one at this point. I've probably heard somebody say this one. Um, I feel like lots of folks eat oysters on their beach vacations in the summer. So I want to say that it's not months with an R because that would rule out all of the tourists who head to the coast in the summertime but I don't know, maybe summer's not a good water. There's too many people in the water and you wouldn't wanna eat something that's filtering tourist water on the beaches. I, I don't know. Okay, well, hold on. People are in the chat now. Mm. Um, everybody, okay, they all disagree with me. So they all say that it's months with an R, answer B. Mm. Well, 
This is a hard question. This is a tricky one. Despite what your granddad or grandma might have told you, you can actually eat oysters any day with a Y. So the answer is A. Eating shellfish in our months made more sense when oysters were only harvested from the wild rather than farmed. So this idea that we're gonna avoid those hot summer months, um, it actually comes from the fact that wild harvest season is closed during that time to allow oysters to reproduce. So that's when oysters are doing their reproductive work in those warmer temperatures. We actually don't allow wild you know, oyster harvest in the summer. Um, so, but with the farmed oysters, they're gonna be available any day with a Y and there are strict environmental rules and monitoring to ensure oysters are safe to eat year round. So what I like to tell people is try to eat oysters once a week. In this country for protein sources, we eat a lot of chicken, beef, pork. Um, we don't eat that much seafood and we probably eat even fewer oysters. Um, so this is an incredibly nutritious source of protein, um, low in fat, high in zinc, very tasty. And I'm going to suggest you help our folks out like James, who are trying to grow this industry and uh, put oysters on your menu, whether that's at home or at your local seafood restaurant once a week. Um, for anyone out there who wants to learn more about the trail, if you want to visit one of these shellfish farms or, you know, learn more about some of the uh, environmental benefits of oysters, please do contact me or Leslie. You can go to the ncoystertrail.org website to learn more. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Just search NC Oyster Trail. Um, with that, I think that's the end of our presentation and we are available here for questions and answers. Excellent stuff. Everybody watching, wherever you're at, round of applause for Jane, Leslie, and James for uh, sharing such a wealth of information about the oyster trail, oysters, and the work that goes into putting them on people's plates. Thanks so much. We do have some questions that have come in in the chat and I'll encourage everybody who's watching, go ahead and drop more questions. We've got plenty of time to have a conversation about what's going on out on the coast. And I'll read the questions off. And Jane, if you want to choose who should answer them, if it's not you, uh, since you'll know more about who should take on some of these questions. Sounds good. All right. Uh, let's see, the first one comes from Megan at the museum, actually. What is driving the decline in wild harvest numbers? Are the wild populations doing worse or is it the increase in farming? Do people just not want wild oysters as much anymore or is it something else altogether? I think we could probably all offer some answer to this. Um, you know, there certainly are, you know, water quality issues, environmental impacts that have brought down our wild oyster populations. Um, they also really um, serve a different market. So generally, wild oysters are going to be served um, as a shucked product. Um, so you might find those in like an oyster stew. Um, but if you are going for the oysters on a half shell, which have become very popular, that is almost always these days a cultivated or farmed product. Uh, Leslie, do you want to add any more there? No, I, I think exactly what you said is correct. Um, just to, to add on to the, the different market value, um, I feel like wild wild grown oysters are typically used in like your fried oyster dishes. Um, and also they're, they're less attractive to have on the plate. So I think that's part of it as well. Um, you know, the farmed oysters like James was talking about are so perfectly tumbled and they're so pretty to look at. Whereas, you know, the wild oyster is gonna be um, it's going to have barnacles on it. It's going to be misshapen. It's not really exactly what you would want to see in your on the half shell dish. Um, but I think exactly what Jane said is is what I would add. What I would say too. One thing you might want a wild oyster though for is your um, oyster roasts. So that is real, you know, kind of tradition in North Carolina. And so we do want to see that wild oyster population grow. And I think all the restoration work is so important there. Uh, James, anything you want to add? Yeah, sure. I would say as far as declining populations go, really the biggest influence is over harvesting. And essentially the problem with over harvesting is you not only remove that animal 
you remove the substrate where future animals would settle on that. And so you've taken the essential pyramid base away from future oysters. And that's what's so important about the work that uh, the Coastal Federation is doing by putting oyster shell and, and shell material back into the water. Great point. Excellent, excellent. All right, another one from Megan. Are there any locations along the trail that allow guests to taste oysters side by side from various different locations, like an oyster tasting, uh, like, a, like you might do a wine tasting? Oh yeah, I think some of our restaurants that are featured on the trail website um, can do that for you. So the Blue Water um, uh, Raw Bar, uh, Grill and Bar that I discussed um, in Manio, in Roanoke Island, they always have several varieties of North Carolina oysters, and they would be happy to give you, a, you know, a plate, a couple dozen, you know, six of each type, um, and then you can kind of see for yourself whether you're a real connoisseur or can you really pick out those different notes. Um, is there anywhere else, James, where you all are selling your oysters that you want to say? Uh, maybe you could. Yeah, there's many different kinds. Absolutely. And I think that's, it's, it's the new um, trend is to try these multiple varieties uh, to see how sensitive your palate is to, to, to see what you like the best. Um, so Tidewater Oyster Bar here in Wilmington, Pinpoint uh, here in Wilmington, Locals Oyster Bar uh, in Raleigh, they've got a tremendous supply. Um, used to be Coastal Provisions had the, I think the best diversity of oysters um, east of the Mississippi, but now they've shut down. So I don't know exactly what's going on um, up there, but, but yeah, absolutely. It's, it's fantastic to be able to try two or three varieties of oysters side by side, because that's how you can really taste the difference. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, Chris has got a question. Do mo not me, another Chris. Do most mariculture use Triploid spat, and to what extent do maricult extent do mariculture practices contribute to wild stocks? Yeah, maybe I'll turn this to James. Sure. So um, I think most folks right now are using a triploid oyster, and that is essentially because of availability and um, due to consistency in the product. Uh, the triploid oyster, just to give you some background information, is essentially the same thing as a seedless watermelon or a seedless grape. And so they do not produce any gametes. So they take all their energy and put that towards growing. So it's great for a farmer because that means your product is gonna to go to market sooner than if you were gonna be farming a diploid. Now, with that being said, um, you lose some of the benefits of uh, additional babies being produced. And also you can kind of get away from uh, maybe having the most local oyster, if your oyster seed typically, at least for us, is being produced by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And so these genetic lines um, are distributed all across the, the East Coast. Um, but, you know, oysters are pretty, uh, are, are what they, they call an osmoconformer. So they're going to taste like the water that they are coming from because they do not uh, regulate their internal um, chemistry. Um, the cool thing about diploids is you can eliminate uh, purchasing uh, oyster babies if you collect your own natural stock. So there are a few companies around North Carolina that are pursuing that. Um, we are one of those and are trying to partner with a couple restaurants to produce a native oyster, a cluster type oyster, uh, more that wild type uh, for Riceville Beach Brewery. Uh, they like to do steam buckets year round. So we're hoping to collect seed out of one of our farms in Masonboro, deploy that in Stump Sound as the grow out location and have the, the native oyster uh, year round. There you go. All right, let's see. Next one here comes from Kim. When multiple spat attached to a shell, is it only one spat that develops into an oyster? I'm going to say no, many do, but Leslie, James, you want to add to that? Yeah, it's not, it's not just the one. So you can, if you look at a, in an oyster reef, they kind of are shaped like 
this and they just kind of build off of each other in all kinds of different directions. Um, so it's definitely not just the one that survives. They just naturally make space for each other on the reef so that they can all be successful. Um, yeah, that's, that's my response to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to throw in there as well. So one of the amazing things about the oyster reef in that uh, clustering growth is that all those nooks and crannies are really what provide the habitat for all of the other uh, associated species like shrimp and fish and crabs that everybody else likes to eat. Um, and, and one of those, uh, when they do grow together, they typically grow a lot skinnier um, because they are, although, you know, sharing space, they are competing against each other for food and other resources. There you go, Kim. David wants to know if oyster farms in North Carolina ship to other places in the country and is a list of those locations available somewhere. If you're not in North Carolina, but you need a North Carolina oyster. Yeah, I do know that's happening, but we do not have a list of those locations on the Oyster Trail website or anywhere that I'm aware of. Uh, James, any particular places that you're aware of where you can go if you're out of North Carolina to get a North Carolina oyster? Well, I would say thinking about the pandemic and, and silver linings, uh, one thing that we've seen is a lot of growers had to pivot to be able to sell oysters directly to consumers. So if you're out of state and are interested in trying a North Carolina oyster, uh, there are a lot of growers now that will ship directly to your home. Um, I don't have a list readily available um, there, I'm sure there's something out there. Um, you could look up interstate shellfish um, shippers. It's a federal um, list of growers who have been licensed to be able to ship out of state. And on the Oyster Trail website, there is a list of growers there like James. And you know, it's worth checking in and telling them if you are out of state and want some North Carolina oysters, you know, they might send you some. If you're looking for the best, <laughs> yeah, <come to> North <laughs> <you> want, <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Okay, let's see here. Uh, the next one is there a niche for home farming for individuals with waterfront homes? Yeah, oyster gardening, that's a thing. Um, Leslie, do you have anything you want to add about that? Um, I know that the state has a program called the UDOC program. Um, I don't think it's as um, it's not functioning maybe as much as it used to be, but it does exist. Um, so if you visit, I believe it's the Division of Marine Fisheries website, um, there is information there. I think they're all in PDF files, um, kind of with instructions on how to get something like that started. So if you have a, a dock or some sort of structure that's out in the water, um, it provides all the resources there for you to start your own little um, mini oyster farm there under a dock or other structure. Um, but it may not be harvestable, so it depends on whether or not your property is in an open or closed water area. So if you're in a closed area, you wouldn't be able to eat your oysters, but they would still be serving all of those um, environmental, they'd still have all the environmental benefits of being there. So they'd be contributing to um, the ecosystem and providing habitat for animals and also filtering the water and improving your water quality there at your, at your home. Okay, there you go. Uh, let's see. It looks like this will be the last one. Lisa is saying, can you say a few things about the cultural importance of oysters to North Carolina coastal communities? I think I'm going to throw this one to James. That's not to me. Yeah, so um, North Carolina is interesting that it has a long history with oyster culture uh, and harvest and um, essentially wars. I think there's a book or two written about uh, Virginia and North Carolina essentially going to battle over uh, oyster rights and the ability to be able to harvest. Um, so oysters are something currently right now where if you are a citizen of North Carolina during the wild caught oyster season, you don't have to have a license to go harvest oysters. Um, you're allowed to harvest one bushel per day as just a citizen. And I think that's a testimony of the importance of oysters for coastal North Carolina uh, citizens as a protein source um, 
and and the the significance of just typically when you think of an oyster roast there's camaraderie and people hanging out around a fire and uh, just having a good time so uh, very significant culturally which makes uh sustainable seafood and restoration practices all the more important so that we can preserve the environmental benefits of having these species in our waterways and uh, make sure that we can enjoy oysters for the future. So thanks to all three of you for the work that you're doing with the NC Oyster Trail, bringing oysters to people and protecting wildlife habitats all together. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you all so much. Thanks a lot. All right, everybody. Hey, thanks for tuning in to today's Lunchtime Discovery Series presentation. Like I said at the beginning, we'll be back next Wednesday, again at noon. Next week, our guest is going to be David Mizjewski from the National Wildlife Federation. Don't want to miss it. We had David give a presentation on uh, native pollinator gardening. Uh, uh, now it would have been a couple of years ago. Amazing. He's got a book out about native pollinators and native gardening. So make sure that you tune in. Join us next Wednesday at noon right here at the museum's YouTube channel. Of course, you can subscribe to the channel below and even click the little bell icon to be notified when we go live with new videos here on the museum's channel. We're doing cool virtual events all the time. So make sure that you stay connected and stay plugged in. You can follow the museum on social media too, of course. We're at Natural Sciences on all the major platforms. And you can follow the Office of Environmental Education on Twitter at EE North Carolina and see their lineup of virtual events at NorthCarolinaEE.org. Make sure that you take advantage of all of those resources. Make sure that you check out the NC Oyster Trail too. I'm gonna have to give that a Google for my next trip out east. And Everybody, take care, stay safe, keep your community safe. We'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody. <laughs>